I see most of you are, most of you are cloud, that's very loud, isn't it? Wow. Uh, most of you are cloud people, um, so I'm guessing there's not that many uh, quantum experts in the room, so we're gonna keep this fairly high level. Um, quantum for most people is gonna be a journey, right? This is gonna be something that's happening over the next decade or so. Um, many folks are gonna start off as, you know, essentially quantum curious, um, and will evolve into being innovators and, um, you know, hopefully incorporating quantum computing into, into your core infrastructure, um, ending up as a, as a real innovator. Um, there's not for everybody. Um, still pretty uncertain outcomes, still pretty uncertain applications, um, certainly in terms of timing. Um, the goal of this session really is to give you a sense of what that journey should look like uh, and hopefully give you some indication as to where and when and if you should embark on you know, your, your, your discovery, essentially, of the quantum universe. Um, so as part of that, uh, I'm going to be joined on stage by Sergio uh, from Moody's Analytics. He's, he's been on that journey a couple of years, uh, has started a quantum team inside Moody's, and he's going to talk about, firstly, how he sees that fitting into the financial services industry, which is a theme today, uh, but also what, he, what, he, what does it actually take to get this type of initiative uh, off the ground in a, in, a, in a large and skeptical organization. Um, so you're certainly the right place. This is, uh, there are more quantum sessions at this reInvent than ever before. Uh, there's a variety of sessions that will deep dive into most of the topics that I'll talk about today. Uh, and there's hands-on workshops for those of you that actually want to get your hands on and run your first quantum algorithm. Um, so let's think about a quick intro. Every quantum session has to start off with, a, you know, what on earth is quantum computing? Um, and I'll keep it. Keep, keep it pretty lightweight. Um, so hopefully some of you got a chance to see the Peter DeSantis uh, keynote last night. He spent 10 minutes or so talking about uh, what quantum is, uh, and in particular diving into the nuts and bolts uh, of quantum error correction, which is sort of the secret technology to actually move this industry out of the experimental era, which is, is sort of in right now. Um, into an era where people are actually running production workloads. So the power of quantum computing is we're computing using quantum mechanics, uh, using the, these mysterious things called qubits. Now, you're pretty good at Googling. I imagine this is the QR code to, um, to Peter's talk, but, uh, but I didn't put it in there. We have plenty of other QR codes coming. Uh, I put it in there just because it's a good visual representation you know, of, of sort of today's bits, ones and zeros. It's a map of ones and zeros at the end of the day. And that's how traditional, quantum, traditional classical computers work. We store all these bits in memory, we add them together, we invert bits, we rotate bits, and we compute by essentially manipulating the bits in a chunk of memory. You know, that's not how quantum computers work. Fundamentally different process. So imagine, rather than bits, we had quantum bits or qubits, and each of these black or white squares rather than just being black or white, just holding two pieces of information, uh, could essentially contain an exponential amount of information. And again, Peter goes into this in some detail. Um, we have the notion of a sphere, and essentially an infinite number of states could be stored in one single qubit. So every dot on this QR code could effectively be a single qubit. Also, the difference is this is a static map. These bits don't change. When you put bits into memory, you, know, you assume they're not going to change until we run a compute cycle on them you know, in our CPU. In a quantum computer, these qubits are interacting. You know, these mysterious force of entanglement operates on qubits that are in a superposition of multiple states. And it's that entanglement coupled with the capacity to, to, to maintain this depth of information density through superposition, and it gives us the power of a quantum computer. So interacting quantum qubits, and that's what makes this technology difficult. That's the reason why we don't have you know, huge data centers full of quantum computers today, is because manipulating quantum bits is fundamentally playing with nature. You're trying to control nature at the subatomic level. You know, any amount of noise is a huge problem. These things, most of the time, live at incredibly cold temperatures to quell as much heat and energy out of the system as possible. So these things, you know, very quickly uh, collapse into a classical state, creating errors, um, and errors limit the amounts of processing that can be performed on the device. So why bother? Um, you know, if you look at most you know, classical systems, there are a certain set of problems that scale really, really badly. Many of you 
probably deal with this issue day in, day out. It's the reason why we have hundreds of different instance types in EC2, because different problems require different levels and types of compute. So problems, for example, have lots of outcomes, lots of potential scenarios. It's very difficult to pick which is the best scenario. Problems that have lots of inputs, lots of interdependencies, it's very difficult to figure out how those interdependencies will resolve into a result. So those types of problems rapidly get out of hand. You have an exponential problem in terms of scale. And that turns into time for processing, you know, or resources and cost. So some problems end up being totally intractable for a classical computer. Even a supercomputer of any size would simply never get to the result. Um, so today we're forced to make assumptions, simplifications to have those problems even be, you know, reasonable to attempt. What's so tantalizing about quantum computers is the ability to change that dynamic and to create essentially a world where quantum computers can speed up other classical processes. They can offload as a coprocessor effectively the math that is particularly suited to a quantum computer. Now, of course, this slide is a, you know, is a very un-AWS slide. We love slides that have lots of data and numbers on them. You'll notice there's not a lot of numbers or data on this slide. It's wonderfully ambiguous. Uh, there's a lot of debate as to when that crossover point's gonna happen. Um, even scientists in the industry, you know, will, will put 10-year error bars, you know, on that magical point. Um, it's still the case today that virtually all quantum computers can be simulated perfectly using classical systems. So there's no speed up today from a production point of view. People aren't running production workloads. If you're nervous that you're somehow behind the curve or you, you, you missed the memo about quantum computing, you know, you didn't. We're in the research phase still. Customers are figuring out how applications work. They're figuring out how algorithms are impacted by performance in quantum machines. And they're researching building better quantum machines. So you can relax. The question now is, of course, when should you start investigating this topic? When does it make any sense? So the first question really is, well, what on earth could these things actually do? Where are these difficult problems that scale so badly? Uh, the good news is, um, they're sort of everywhere, you know, common problems in many, 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 many industries, very broad applicability. Um, so potential to impact, you know, how we live and how we treat the planet and important things like that. Um, the categories of applications, you know, I get asked a lot about, you know, which applications might this impact first. I tend to think of quantum applications as falling into three categories. Um, the first is probably the most obvious one, which is simulating quantum systems. So using a quantum computer to simulate quantum systems. And what that means ultimately is building, for example, digital twins of molecules or chemical reactions to try and build better molecules or make chemical reactions more act uh, more efficiently, build better catalysts, that type of thing. And you can see how that would play in some of the applications on the right-hand side uh, of this chart. Also optimizing infrastructural or logistical systems, things where you've got a lot of potential decisions to make about how to do something to optimize some characteristic, whether it be energy or speed or accuracy or whatever. And the third area is in decision making itself. So I'm thinking about machine learning, uh, reduce risk, reduce cost, get a higher gain from our investments. This is certainly an area that Sergio uh, will talk about in a minute from Moody's perspective. But we have a long way to go. Uh, and if, again, if you listen to Peter DeSantis' keynote yesterday, uh, you know, he explained that to get to genuine quantum advantage in these application areas, we need to be able to be running you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of qubits, um, perfect qubits ideally, that can run hundreds of billions of operations. You know, we are nowhere near that place yet in quantum computing. Today's quantum computers can run tens of qubits, you know, hundreds, maybe a thousand operations. So we are you know, four, five, six orders of magnitude away in terms of the amount of processing that can be performed on a quantum computer to deliver value in these applications. But still, um, long way to go. Um, so the issues right now are, how do we plot that future? You know, how do we identify what that horizon looks like? How do we identify which application space it fits, it fits first? Um, which of the various quantum technologies might be most applicable to a particular problem? Uh, and how you can sort of spot that trajectory? You know, and how can you understand what success might look like in the next three, five years or so uh, in terms of research? 
So that's the reason fundamentally why we launched uh, the Amazon Bracket service. Uh, we launched it at, uh, at reInvent in 2019, 2019 uh, and it went GA in the middle of 2020. So it's about three years or so old now. And our goal was really to fundamentally democratize access to quantum computers, um, to give everybody fundamentally the same tools to perform the type of research that I just talked about. It wasn't always that way. And back in the good old days, you know, you sort of had to know a physicist or you had to you know, have a special deal or a big subscription to get access to a quantum machine. Uh, we took away all of that, simple process, uh, pay as you go, you know, typical AWS if you like. Um, and we wanted to make it fundamentally part of the AWS cloud. Um, prior to that, quantum computers were available through web services. Uh, websites, but essentially, you know, independent technology, isolated, disconnect, disconnected from the compute resource in the cloud. And what you'll get to realize is quantum computers are not replacement for classical machines. They very tightly integrate with classical computers and probably always will. So making this a resource that's available in the cloud as a, as a regular asset, if you like, in the AWS environment was very important to us. The other thing that was super important was to keep open-minded. You know, this this is a race that will run for some years. This, if this is a marathon, we are sort of still tying our shoelaces. Um, this is not the time to get locked into a particular technology or particular developer tools or a particular framework. This is a time to keep your eyes you know, wide open and watch a lot of different things. And we also wanted to be the voice of reason. One thing you may notice if you look into this industry is an immense amount of hype. Uh, there's a lot of claims. There's a lot of investment going into this industry. That makes people generally you know, be optimistic about the progress that's being made. Uh, we think it's really important to have the voice of the customer obviously forefront uh, and enable customers to figure out exactly what's working, exactly what's not working, uh, you know, and what progress we're making along that path. Think of, you could think of Bracket really as being a town square for quantum computing. The goal is to essentially bring the community together, software developers, you know, resellers, educators, hardware providers, end users together to try and innovate. Sometimes you'll hear uh, Amazonians talk about the innovation flywheel where we just try and generally just move everything along quicker. We've done that in lots of industries, robotics, IoT, uh, and we think that same process works uh, in quantum. And that's fundamentally what the Bracket service is about. I'll give you a quick look into how Bracket works. We tend to think uh, in terms of three steps. Um, Workshops, as I said, for, for, for all of this, getting hands-on. Um, today, it's all about exploration, um, sort of training, if you like, in the ML world, rather than inference, you know, not running production workloads. Um, so start off by designing your quantum algorithms. I've drove, I showed a picture of a, of a quantum circuit here. Uh, it doesn't always need to be a quantum algorithm that looks like a circuit like that. We run a, a developer environment. Um, the hosting notebooks, a lot of it is built around uh, Jupyter Notebooks, so very similar sort of look and feel uh, to machine learning. If you're familiar with SageMaker, uh, very similar sort of concepts in terms of how you get started. Um, tools and tutorials, obviously this is a very educational centric period we're in right now, so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of materials that will step you through different types of quantum algorithms. Uh, second phase is test, run these things on simulators. Today, the good news is, you know, we're in the regime where quantum computers can be simulated, which means you can test your algorithms, you can evaluate the resources, you can see what works and what doesn't seem to work on a quantum simulator. We have free simulators in our SDK and managed high performance simulators on the service. So that's good news. In the future, of course, when quantum computers outpace simulators, then that gets more tricky. But for now, you can simulate most things and customers start their journey with simulators. Then move on to hardware. Um, really here we're studying you know, the impact of noise. The difference between a simulator and a quantum computer is noise and errors. So what's the impact of those errors? How do they change the algorithm? How do they limit the scope of the algorithm? And what tools could you put in place to try and minimize the impact of errors? As I said, when we, um, when we started Bracket, we had a vision of essentially bringing all of the different types of quantum computers um, to customers' fingertips. There's at least a half a dozen ways in which you can build a quantum computer. And even within those different modalities, very different architectures and very different points of differentiation. So these are the four devices that are available on Bracket uh, right now. Um, we'll keep this fresh. This, this is not a permanent list. Um, in AWS, we hate deprecating anything because customers obviously get used to using that asset. Quantum's different, you know, as I say, it's research. Quantum computers will come and go uh, as they get interesting or less interesting to customers and we'll be constantly trying to bring uh, new examples of what we think are leading edge technology uh, to market. 
It's all about exposing differentiation. I'm not trying to dumb this down or homogenize this in any way. It's all about those little edge cases, those little points of, of, of differentiation, ultimately what might spark innovation in this industry, which is fundamentally what we're all about. Um, I will do a shout out to these four partners. Um, in a building a quantum computer is extremely difficult. And having one run every day, hour after hour after hour, and run customer workloads in a predictable fashion is really hard. We speak, as you would imagine, to almost anybody on the planet that's building a quantum computer. And we have heard a lot of roadmaps. And we've had a lot of promises about machines that will be ready. Eh, you know, not many of them showed up. Um, these guys did. And I think they deserve a shout out for, you know, for taking the plunge and exposing their technology. And we work them, with them every day. Uh, to make their devices more reliable, more resilient, more consistent, and just part you know, of what will one day be a global elastic quantum computing infrastructure. All right, so I'm sure now you're thinking, okay, mm, you know, is this ready for prime time? Should I be worried about this now? Should I wait a couple of years? Um, I'm gonna try and walk you through a little bit of a journey. Um, as I say, most people start quantum curious. Uh, hopefully we'll evolve um, to become an innovator in the future uh, and lead an industry. Um, it's a path that those folks have to go down, hopefully trying to converge on make, what makes sense. Um, what I'll do, I've sort of used this narrative as a way to review maybe the last nine months or so uh, of things that we've launched um, on Bracket uh, and exposed to customers and some of the things that we've had, you know, some of the more positive feedback from customers in terms of how it's enabled them to make some progress through their journey. Um, I didn't really intend this to be a timeline. I thought it would be useful, really, um, essentially to give you a sense of the landscape. You know, by talking about these different deliverables in the context of where they lie, if you like, from relatively entry level to you know, deep and meaningful work, um, should give you a sense, I think, of, um, of where you might be on this curve. All right? and which, where you start running out of steam thinking, oh boy, that sounds too complicated, then you've probably found your spot. Um, so the next few slides are going to have lots of resources, lots of QR codes. So uh, if, you, if you're interested in capturing some of those resources and picking up on them, um, now is uh, a time to get your phone out. All right. On the very left-hand side of the diagram, starting this journey, quantum curious. Um, it's obviously critical we can help people get started. Uh, and there's a huge level of of resources in AWS, there's a program called Skills Builder, which does an amazing job of educating customers on all of the things that happen in AWS, which is immense. Proven path. Uh, and just last week, we launched uh, a free self-paced level 100, level 200 uh, quantum course, bracket course. Um, there's even a certificate, a bracket badge, a technology badge, uh, so you can track your progress. Uh, this QR code takes you to a blog that announces that program. Um, you want to do even more training, get even more hands-on. Every month we run a free uh, hands-on workshop, two-day workshop. Um, if you want to register for that, uh, just go to the Bracket main uh, webpage on the Amazon site. Once you get sort of comfortable thinking about quantum programs and you've run your first circuits and you've proven that entanglement and superposition are really are a thing and it, not just magic, uh, then you'll, you know, you'll evolve in a quantum algorithm. So if you like the next step in the journey, um, so to try and make that easier, this, you know, this gets deep pretty quick. Uh, we've partnered with uh, an open source uh, framework team called Penny Lane. Uh, this link takes you to their um, Penny Lane demo site. So it's a great resource, breaks down applications into all of the application areas we, we talked about a little bit earlier. Sample codes, uh, Jupyter notebooks, pre-built tutorials, that sort of thing. And most of them have a built on, a run on bracket button where you can go straight from their sample code straight to a running circuit uh, on a bracket simulator or on a QPU. What you'll notice is a lot of those algorithms are hybrid algorithms. You know, they involve both classical compute and quantum compute working together in tandem to run through the process. Um, that's a really central part of quantum computing these days. Uh, in, the, in, a, in the world of noisy computers, dealing with those errors and using classical machines to try and overcome those errors it becomes pretty pivotal. Um, so we did a lot of work. We have a feature on Bracket called Bracket Hybrid Jobs. Um, 
In the future, we expect quantum computers to make classical systems faster, a true speed up. Today, it's sort of the other way around. Today, we use machine learning and classical tools to make quantum computers run better, uh, which means you run lots and lots of circuits, lots of iterative steps, almost like training in machine learning um, to train the quantum algorithm to deal with noise better, to understand how those errors are affecting the result and tweak parameters uh, on, a, on the same program, but tweak parameters to overcome to some degree the effects of noise. That's an iterative process. These experiments can be relatively long running, um, but it means it's gotta be tight, all right? It's an iterative loop. So managing the overhead, optimizing this performance, you know, understanding prioritization, making sure you can actually get on the device when you need to, becomes really important in evaluating these types of algorithms. Um, the QR code takes you to a blog, uh, I think a couple of weeks ago, we put out a blog with a, um, a Danish partner, a company called Quantify. Uh, they have a particular algorithm called FastVQE. Um, it's interesting, I think, because it's, uh, it ties into the molecular simulation uh, use case that I talked about earlier. They use this feature. Uh, I think it's a pretty easy way to get into that subject. Um, it walks you through the process, walks you through the algorithm. Um, so we did quite a lot this year. We dramatically reduced the overhead in the service to cut down that cycle time. Uh, we introduced some compilation capabilities so you can compile your quantum algorithm once uh, and then rerun it potentially thousands of times. That reduces a huge burden. Quantum compilation, so going from the circuit I showed you earlier to the actual pulses that run on the machine, uh, it, it is a pretty compute intensive process. So minimizing the amount of times you have to do that's a big deal. So we launched parametric compilation and we also made it easier to go from a Python notebook to run directly a quantum algorithm on the bracket service. So quite a few things to make the use of algorithms, hybrid algorithms in particular, uh, a lot more effective. So in terms of actual hardware, we launched um, a new QPU uh, in May, I think this year. Um, as I said, one of our goals um, is not just to show you a, a diversity of quantum hardware, but to show you generational changes within the same hardware. Because I think that allows us to plot the trajectory better. You know, we want, want to understand how quickly are the different hardware providers innovating and how quickly are their technologies resolving these challenges of fidelity and, and, uh, and qubit count. Um, so we launched originally, way back when, we met GA with the Harmony device uh, from one of our partners, IonQ, had uh, 11 qubit device. Uh, and this year we just launched uh, their Aura device, which is their, their yeah, current generation, uh, 25 qubits, but most importantly, half the error rate of the Harmony device. Both devices are available on Bracket, both available uh, pay as you go, just on demand, just run a circuit. And you can compare directly, essentially, this generational shift uh, within the IonQ portfolio. The QR code is, is a link to the blog uh, when we launched it a while back. What's also interesting is the ARIA machine is the first device on Bracket that actually has built-in error mitigation. So this is not error correction that, that we talked about a little bit earlier and Peter DeSantis talked about last night. Uh, this is post-processing to overcome some of the errors that generated. It's imperfect. Um, the near-term benefit of error, of error mitigation is pretty hotly debated in the industry. It's still not quite clear whether the juice is worth the squeeze for error mitigation, but there's only one way to find out. You know, you put it on the service and you see how it impacts customers' ability to, to run algorithms uh, and see how it works from an operational point of view. One of our other goals with hardware, um, as I said, is to be open-minded. Uh, so far, I've almost entirely talked about gate-based quantum computers, which is a sort of familiar programming concept, if you like, if you're used to designing digital electronics, um, you're familiar with the concepts of gates and operations, um, but it's not the only way that things can be done. And um, this time last year, we launched uh, a new machine, an analog device, analog quantum computer. Um, most analog computers are effectively analog devices, quantum computers, um, and the, the gate representation is an abstraction. Uh, if you peel that away, you can actually program these things directly at the analog level. Uh, and we launched the first, the, the, the first atom-based computer uh, that was publicly available a year or so ago. Um, I mention it because you know, it's, what's interesting is most quantum computers are fixed in their geometry. You, know, you design a chip and you put the qubits on the chip and off you go. Um, an atom-based machine, you can move these atoms around. You can space them in any place you like. So you can build an array, you can essentially build a map 
and map your problem directly onto it. So this is great for simulating analog systems that I talked about earlier. And there's a paradigm that we call analog Hamiltonian simulation, or AHS. And this is a great way to explore that concept. You know, there are plenty of arguments to say this might be one of the first areas in which we see some sort of quantum advantage. Uh, but it's a different way of thinking, different way of programming, and our goal was to bring you know, that to market. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm talking about it here is because when we launched, it was only available for a few hours a week. It was a, you know, it's, a, it's a specialist device, it's a single-threaded machine, uh, and a couple of months ago, we increased the capacity on the device by about 12 times, so it's now available basically all week long during the working week. So what that meant for customers is dramatically reduced the wait time. It's a popular machine, long wait times on the machine typically, um, so you know, hopefully dealt with that problem. Um, all right, in spirit of journeys, I talked about analog programming in the context of atom-based machines. Um, but you can also apply atom, excuse me, you can also apply analog programming to, to um, gate-based machines. Um, we're right along the journey now, so this is starting to get somewhat, somewhat deeper. And this, is, again, is not probably for everyone. This is probably more geared towards folks that are really, really, really trying to optimize the performance of a machine, even a particular qubit in an array for their application. So fairly specialist stuff. The QR code takes you to uh, a blog uh, from a month or so ago uh, where we explained how you can actually tweak and optimize the gates that are built into the Oxford quantum circuits, um, quantum computer called Lucy. Um, at the end of the day, quantum computer uses microwave pulses, very precise microwave pulses, to actually get these qubits into a state of superposition uh, and, and deliver gates for entanglement. Um, when these chips are characterized, that's, that pulse sequence, if you like, to enable that to happen, gets sort of fixed in stone, um, becomes generalized across the chip, becomes a standard gate preparation. It's how that particular machine executes that particular function. But you can go tweak that. Right? You can get into pulse programming, and you can start and modify how individual gates on individual qubits operate. And if you're in the business of squeezing every last ounce of value out of a machine, run those extra few operations, this is sort of how you do it. Um, think about potentially building your own custom settings into the quantum chip yourself. It's almost like, uh, you know, I love car analogies. So it's, it's like rechipping your engine. You know, you want to boost performance, you want to boost acceleration, you want to boost miles per gallon. You know, you go down that path. Not for everybody. Um, it's there. And then right at the extreme, um, I wanted to talk about a, a paper that we uh, launched again, about a month or so ago. Um, so some algorithm researchers you know, look way beyond today's hardware. Their point is, you know what? Machines today can't do anything useful. Right? You, you can only get into the realm of useful compute once we have error-corrected machines, fault-tolerant devices. Uh, but that still begs the question, well, how big a device do you need? What sort of applications might you run on such a machine, you know, even though they might be years away? Um, that's a big theoretical process. You can't do that work on existing quantum computers. That's a theoretical exercise. Uh, and our theory team published a paper which is effectively a survey of the compute resources needed for a wide array of different types of quantum algorithms that address many of the use cases that I talked about earlier. So this, you know, this is expert territory. The QR code takes you to a blog that launches that paper. Uh, obviously, the paper sits behind that. It's hundreds of pages. It's designed to be almost, almost like a compendium of applications. It's not, uh, it's not a typical research paper. It's, it's a resource. Uh, and we put it out there, hoping that customers and researchers would tweak it over time you know, and figure out what it means to run the overhead of these different algorithms on particular fault-tolerant machines you know, in the future. So the goal is to inspire researchers to really dig into that. Um, you know, it's, it's very tempting to get sort of hooked into the, you know, gee, what can machines do today? And what's the race look like to build a better machine today? Um, but we also need to look farther out because building roadmaps of the machines that might deliver that sort of performance, we need to understand what algorithms, algorithmic requirements those machines would need. All right, so that's, um, and Sergio was telling me earlier that you just read this paper and uh, it was very complimentary and I appreciate that. All right, that's a recap of the things that we've, uh, that we've done in the last nine months or so. Hopefully that's given you a sense of, of how things sort of get sticky as you go rightwards on this diagram and where you think you might be on this diagram. 
Um, I want to change gears a little bit and actually talk about something we actually want to announce today. So we have some announcements, this reInvent, it's all about announcements. Um, so I want to introduce a new uh, way of accessing quantum computers on Bracket. We call it Bracket Direct. Uh, so this is geared to, essentially to power users. And I folks that are more on the right-hand side of that diagram. Um, so some customers, once they're through the basics, they've learned it, they've got their head around algorithms, you know, they've played with a few different types of machines, you know, they need to dive deeper. You know, they need to engage the service. They want to talk to the specialists uh, on my team behind the service, and they want to engage the hardware partners directly. You know, you get to the point where you just need to know how these machines work and which trade-offs really matter as you program a device. Um, so if you go to the Bracket console uh, today, it just went up last night, um, you'll see a button where you can reserve access to quantum computers um, and get dedicated 100% capacity of that machine all to yourself for the period of that reservation. So this is a big shift from the way we have operated the service exclusively to date. So when we launched the service, this was a pay-as-you-go, submit an algorithm, algorithm run on a quantum machine, public queue. You're in a queue, we've released various features over the year to give you a better sense of where you are in that queue and when your algorithm might run. Uh, we've introduced a lot of prioritization into the hybrid jobs feature I talked about earlier, so that when your iterative job starts running, you get priority back on the machine. You don't go to the back of the queue. But even so, if you need to know when your algorithm is actually going to run, say you're running a live event or a live workshop, you have a deadline to finish a paper, a deadline to complete a proof of concept, or you just want to absolutely minimize the runtime of your algorithm, which is important because these machines drift, they're analog devices. Remember, errors are the problem. So you want your algorithm to run quick and you want it to run with a degree of confidence. So reservations are the way to do that. Um, so now you have the choice. You can run single programs whenever you like, through a queue, pay as you go, or uh, book a reservation, still pay as you go, no subscriptions, um, just pay for the reservations you make on any of the devices. So three components. I talked about uh, reserving the machine, access to quantum specialists. Um, Quantum computing is one of those topics where you sort of need a helping hand sometimes. Particularly if you've booked a reservation, you've got your four-hour slot or whatever it's going to be. You want to make sure you're going to use that time wisely. So a reservation comes with a free consultation period that you can speak to our scientists, go through your workloads, assuming you're happy to share it, um, and we'll optimize that time and gear you towards success. Um, think of... Um, for those of you that have been watching you know, EC2 launches recently, there was, there was an EC2 launch called Capacity Blocks, uh, I guess six weeks or so ago. Very similar concept. You know? So if you're, you know, if you're deep in the weeds of ML, trying to use some of the biggest GPU instances, you'll know that there are, you know, there's wait times and availability, issue, availability issues there as well. So very similar concepts. So EC2 Capacity Blocks, you can reserve some of the chunkier GPUs for your private dedicated use, build a fleet, and know that it's going to be there for you. Uh, in a sense, this is a similar concept, but for quantum computers. Most of the machines and partners you work with, there's only a single device, and these things are single-threaded. So you know, once an algorithm is running, uh, you know, you're waiting for that algorithm to finish before you're on the machine. This is a way of getting past that problem. Um, also, from our point of view, it's going to be a, a mechanism for launching new features. Oftentimes, when a new machine comes along, or a new feature, we don't have a lot of capacity on that device. You know, these are really our experimental machines. The machines are in labs uh, maintained by scientists. Uh, so often we don't have a lot of capacity. I mentioned the Curio device earlier. We only had a few hours when we first launched it. Uh, that's not really enough for a global public, uh, generally available uh, pay-as-you-go audience. Um, so reservations is going to be the way where we'll essentially tease out and trial new hardware and new features uh, through reserve customers, um, where we can you know, do that hand-holding and we can be confident that we have the capacity on hand to serve the needs. So uh, through this program, uh, which is free, um, you'll get access to uh, leading-edge stuff. All right. So in the spirit of getting access to leading-edge stuff, um, I'm also pleased to announce that um, the INQ Forte device is going to be available for the first time through Bracket Direct Reservations. Um, so I mentioned earlier that we've, we launched initially with the Harmony device from INQ. Earlier this year, we added the ARIA device from the INQ. Now we're making available the Forte device from INQ. 
Uh, this is the first time this machine, this is their latest hardware, this is the first time this machine has been available uh, for public access. So now we have three generations of quantum computers which help you plot that trajectory. It's more qubits, 30 qubits, um, available uh, right now. Just go book a reservation, go to the console, uh, and you on that machine. Again, limited capacity, um, but early access is important you know, if you're looking to, uh, to sort of get ahead of the curve a little bit. Um, We've had a couple of customers have used the device um, in the last couple of weeks um, just to you know, get a feel for it. Um, so Kedma uh, is an uh, Israeli-based uh, algorithm company focused on error mitigation. So error mitigation, as I said earlier, is a, is a big deal. It's post-processing. It's not error correction, but it's post-processing. Obviously, from Kedma's point of view, the, the, the higher the fidelity you can start with makes a dramatic impact on the amount of error correction that you can do. Uh, and Kevin have been working with, uh, with my team and with the IQ team to, uh, to experiment with error mitigation around Forte. And also, we've been working with the quantum team uh, at Deloitte, uh, Deloitte of an algorithm team, and they're building algorithms uh, in this particular case to, uh, to, to build synthetic MRI images for medical imaging, um, which is harder to do than you would imagine. Uh, and they've been building 100 or so uh, images over the last couple of weeks and testing them against simulators using the new uh, INQ Forte machine. Anyway, I'm going to stop there and introduce my co-speaker, Sergio. Um, so Sergio is the uh, managing director for AI, ML, and Quantum uh, at Moody's Analytics. This is a financial services oriented pitch, so you are perfectly qualified, my friend. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, so actually, I want to start saying, oh my God, the lights are... <laughs> um, I want to start saying something. I typically go to many quantum conferences around, and I'm always surrounded by physicists, which is great, really smart people who created all this. But coming here is like feeling at home, because I myself am I'm, I'm an engineer, and if there's one takeaway that I can give you today is, now you can be an engineer, you can be a software developer, you can go into bracket, you can do these things without needing a PhD in, uh, in physics or anything like that. We still need the physicist, so don't go too far, but now it's the time to get more people into, into the field. So as Richard said, um, my name is Sergio. I run both the quantum and the AI teams at Moody's. Uh, those two are different horizons. So even though some people on the hype side of things try to mix them, uh, there are different horizons and endeavors on, on what we do. And why a company like Moody's is interested in quantum? Some of you may know about us as the ratings agency, but that's really half of the company. Yes, we are a ratings agency, but the Moody's analytics side of our company has one mission, that is, telling companies, institutions, governments, whether to do business with someone or something is okay. Analyze risk from all the different factors. And this means that we stream in an ocean of data that's unheard of. And that's actually one of the things I love the most about working in this company. We have heap lots of data. And in the financial industry, whether it is credit risk management, optimizing portfolios, analyzing ESG outlooks, analyzing supply chain risks, all that is derived by data. And we've been doing AI and ML for a long time, and now large language models and so on, but quantum can't really be the next frontier. So when I started working in quantum, I always thought, man, I was born too late for uh, exploring space. The, sorry, too late for creating the internet and all that, and way too early for exploring space. So what's for us in this decade or decades? And quantum was the answer. We live in amazing moments where we have all these technologies, whether horizon one, two, three, that are helping us reshape how we do things. And some of the problems or, or mathematical challenges or computational problems that Richard's, Richard was showing before are the ones that we face on a daily basis. We have problems on Moody's that take days or even weeks to compute, and even that is not enough. Now, we're safe because everyone in the world has exactly the same issue. You can go on HPC, high-performance computing, and supercomputers of all kinds. You can do FPGAs. You can do a bunch of things, but still, you are limited 
by the definition of the problem and how our computers work today. So this gives us, uh, quantum computing gives us hope. Now, what are we? I always love to use this slide because it's really a great representation of where quantum is today. Right in the late 50s, Bank of America was the very first bank in the world who deployed well, the kind of the first ATM, if you will. That was, a, it was called Irma, and it was developed in, in combination with academia. Now, that device was clunky, was big, was very hard to develop and to maintain, very costly, it required very specific expertise, rings a bell. But little they knew what would come out of that. But yeah, that was intended only to optimize some of the manual processes that they did, that the humans did. Did they think about the internet, the app stores, bloody hell, large language models? All those are things that we have created in the last few decades. So we are in those moments where we're trying to use quantum computers to do better some of the things that we're doing today in a lousy way. Now, what else can we build? How differently can we think about those processes and building that stuff together? Now, that's a beautiful story, right? The only difference is that it took many decades to go from Irma or from a, any other IBM large computers all the way to your smartphones in your pocket today. But we're standing on top of giant shoulders. We don't need to reinvent the wheel for quantum computers. We can use most of our data set, sorry, most of our data tools, most of the stuff that we use for machine learning can be repurposed for the stuff that we do in quantum. In fact, if you're a data scientist, your path into quantum, it's going to be fairly easy because you're going to be doing stuff in Python with tools like PyTorch. The similarities between SageMaker and Bracket are pretty good. So it's a very good path into that. But the path is not easy. So at Moody's, we don't do portfolio optimization for ourselves. We do it for our clients. We virtually work with every bank or insurance company or asset manager in the world. And we wanted to figure out what are really those problems that people are trying to solve with quantum computers. If you go out and ask the quantum hardware companies, they're very vested into making this happen. And some of them say, everyone, every 14, 500 company in the, finance, in the financial industry is investing lots of money in quantum. Not right. We went out and asked them, as the people in the banks, the ones that were experts in credit risk management, asset management, and all those actual real life problems in there. And we realized that 75%, 73%, sorry, do not identify bottlenecks on their process, which is a fantastic answer. It means that they don't know how better things can get. But on top of that, 82% thought that, and they, we asked this to people who knew about quantum, they did see that quantum was extremely immature. Now, maybe some of you have read in places like quantum advantage is around the corner. Quantum AI is a thing. There's quantum advantage for NP-complete problems. And we're still working on those things. It's a journey. Many of these companies that start thinking about return of investment on the things that they do today are gonna to be in big trouble to justify their budgets moving forward. You have to start investing today because it's really hard to get in. The industry is evolving, identifying the use cases, but if you overpromise, then you're gonna have a hard time with your CEO. So what I'm gonna to try to explain today is a road into quantum in your company. I was sitting where you were sitting today a few years ago and thinking, all right, this is great, this is lovely, Many, some of you have already played with some of the, the, the tools out there, with Bracket, with uh, frameworks like Kiskit. But how do I go up to my boss or to the CEO of my company and convince them to start a quantum computing team? And that's what I did a couple of years ago. So I'm gonna try to share with you the pros and cons and, the, and, and some of the ways to do that. So how do you build a quantum computing strategy? Thinking about coherence times of your qubits, how many different devices are gonna be needed? What is the error rates? How do you build quantum error correction? That's needed. But if you go with that to your CEO, you're gonna have a hard problem, right? You have to think about what's the business value of, your, of what you're trying to solve. So the first of all is 
find the relevant use cases. And that is a much more difficult thing to do than it looks like. Because if your company is relatively large, you're gonna have to go to different units, to different divisions, lines of businesses, and ask them, hey, do you guys have any problem out there that it takes a long time to be solved or to be computed? And maybe they're not being aware of that. It's the story of the baby elephant in the circus that was tied to a, to a pole, and then the elephant couldn't move. Then the elephant is big, could of course kick the, the pole and, and go anywhere, but it doesn't do it because you don't know anything better. So you're gonna have to be very critical, speak with a lot of people, and identify those use cases. Now, as I've said, be realistic. Don't go to these people and say, don't worry, I have an algorithm for you that's gonna do exponentially faster the problems that you're solving. Now you have to tell them there's a technology that promises exponential or quadratic speed ups or maybe accuracy improvements and we have to work together on that. I am not in finance or I was not in finance before coming to Moody's, so some of those problems I had to learn about them myself. How they calculate credit risk, how the Basel III uh, capital uh, regulatory capital requirements work and all that stuff. You have to partner with the domain experts because they're the ones doing the work today. You're gonna bring the quantum knowledge. Now, in order to make this happen from an innovation perspective, you have to create momentum. You have to make a lot of noise, basically, so you secure the budget. So who's gonna be the quantum champion that's going to be working with that? First of all, the person leading the pack, and that's gonna be ideally one of you, but then inside all of your different product groups, there's gonna be someone who you can trust to drive that internally in that product group. Now, in banks, insurance companies, or companies like Moody's, we're kind of lucky, because a lot of physicists and mathematicians actually went into finance back in the 80s and so on, because that was the way of making the, the biggest buck. So we, find, we found a lot of people who said, hey, Sergio, this is great that we're doing this. You know, my PhD was in quantum mechanics back in the 90s. Can I join your team? And these people have been our champions across all the different groups, whether it's in banking, insurance, predictive analytics, and so on. A lot of these people have been working with analytical models or machine learning. So they are already knowing the pipelines, the data flows, and even the tooling in some cases. At the end of the day, quantum mechanics is a lot about algebra, exactly like machine learning. So there's a lot of similarities in, in there. Now, one of the first things that I heard from one of my colleagues back in the day about two years ago was, all right, Sergio, this is great, sounds fantastic, can you demo a quantum computer for me? And that was a little bit hard to do because what does demo a quantum computer mean? That, kind of, that was a light bulb moment for me because I realized if we want to get this through, if we want to make this happen, we have to show it. Even if it's with a very small POC, something that people can see and something that people can compare. You're saying this process that takes three days to compute, now I'm gonna do it in minutes. So let me just build something that you can actually see. Even if it's a toy model, it's something small and easy to show. It doesn't have to be production-wise, and by the way, this applies also for anything LLMs or machine learning in, in general. Uh, and then build a proper plan that you can give to your CEO. Now, if your plan integrates something like Quantum Advantage tomorrow, and we're gonna acquire a lot of market share, then you're, gonna, you're not gonna be able to uh, deliver those promises. But if your plan is, there is a technology that promises advantage on the things that we do today. Some of our competitors are already playing with that. That are the startups that are working heavily on this and can overtake us very fast. Do you want to be the only CEO or the first CEO who risks all that just for this amount of investment? Kind of FOMO technique. Um, hire a multidisciplinary team. Physicists are important. We need to trust the science. But there's a lot of MLOps work as well on what we do. 
And that's where, where Bracket comes in very handy because it helps us integrate all this into our pipelines. At Moody's, we are a very big shop on, on AWS. A lot of our workloads, classical workloads, work in, in the usual tools from, from AWS. So it's pretty natural to just throw our data from an S3 bucket over to Bracket, run the algorithm, get the results back, and dump them into Redshift, for example. So all those things come in very handy, especially when you think about IP, data privacy, and, and stuff like that. Uh, and consider, consider cybersecurity as one of the angles. In fact, one of the main drivers for many financial institutions is the promise that quantum computers can break the cryptography of the world. RSA algorithms and all that, what we call Shor's algorithm, which is represented by my t-shirt, by the way. Um, so this is one of the angles. When you tell clients, hey, do you know that a quantum computer can make all your cryptography useless? We don't know exactly when, right? We're calling this year two quantum as a re re reminder to year 2000, if some of you live through, uh, through those times, except now we don't know the date, right? Back then we knew that December 31st, uh, 1999 was going to be a debacle unless we worked very hard for the previous months on fixing and upgrading our systems. Now we don't know who is gonna have the first quantum computer capable of running uh, a Shor's algorithm to crack a 4096 RSA key. So how do you get about this? The first thing is analyzing your current challenges. And most likely they would fall into one of these buckets, the way you solve them today. Do you solve them with artificial intelligence running in the cloud? You run on using, you run uh, smart algorithms, things like classical, very smart algorithms on your data, and then HPC or even FPGAs and other techniques. Normally, it would fall into one or several of these categories, the way you do these type of uh, um, optimizations. Once you have those backheads, you can think about the industry applications. Don't go to your peers and say, hey, I have quantum amplitude estimation algorithm that can uh, run Monte Carlo simulations. Or I have a variation alg algorithms that can improve machine learning workloads. Think about the industrial use case. That then is going to leverage one of those algorithms for sure. And by the way, in the paper that Richard mentioned before, there's a fantastic collection and summary of a lot of the things that, have been, that are being researched at the moment. So things like weather modeling, Things like asset probability of default. What are the chances of a given company uh, defaulting and when? Derivative pricing, capital allocation, outlier detection or fraud detection as a, as a, as a subset of that. Uh, Forex route optimization, decrypt the internet. Right? Those are cases that are relevant in the financial industry. When I brought this slide to the managing directors of the company, I had hands being raised saying, hey, I work with that square. Another one, hey, I work with that other square. Are you saying that in a few years, I'm gonna have a system that can do that much, much better or in a more accurate way? And then people start to get interested. So the way we work is, and this is our specific quantum strategy, is divided in four pillars. And this has proved to be very beneficial for us internally, but also for our clients. One of the things that we do the most is thought leadership and, uh, and application leadership. What this means is that we go and speak with our clients and tell them, hey, this is the path, the journey into quantum. This is how you start. And sometimes it's a presentation like, like this one. And these are the things that you have to consider. By the way, we have all these use cases that we're working on. And if, we, if you want, we can jointly develop other use cases. In fact, something that we do very often is three lateral agreements, where we go with one quantum company, one of our clients, ourselves, in some cases, some public uh, uh, initiatives or f from the government, and together, jointly develop a use case. I'm gonna show you a couple of examples later. Community engagement, fundamental. This is a material industry. Everything can change tomorrow. I run one newsletter, I call it it's the Quantum Pirates newsletter. I didn't put a QR code, but if you want to search for it, every Monday you will have all the news about quantum in your inbox. And every week there's a breakthrough. Maybe in quantum error correction, maybe a new device, maybe a new partnership. And it's amazing to live 
through these times. Because you quickly have to be on top of everything and your weekends are about reading papers and seeing what is out there. So community partnerships are fundamental. They are going to be in the shape of hackathons at universities. We do them with many universities, ETH in Zurich, with the Trinity College in, in Dublin, with the MIT. We do that in partnership also with some of these companies. Of course, we work on our own products. We have identified our products on the shelf. For example, Portfolio Studio is one of them. That product calculates conditional value at risk of portfolios. That is basically what regulators require banks to do so they can have a reserve, basically a pocket of money, to uh, protect the investments that they make. If someone was around during 2018, uh, during 2008, probably you know why that was needed. Um, and then, of course, security and defense. As I've said, security, cybersecurity is going to be a big thing. We don't know exactly when we're going to be able to run Peter Shor's algorithm, but we will be able to do that. And there is one key element in there, which is harvest now and decrypt later. So today, any bad actor can uh, uh, store your communications. Sure, they're going to be protected, and they're, not going, to be to read, they're going, to be, not going to be able to read on them, but at some point, they will. So is that data going to be a liability in 5, 8, 10, 15 years from now? If the answer is yes, then you have to start thinking about how you change your encryption mechanisms on that. NIST, the NSA, many companies, AWS uh, included, are already working on this, on what we call post-quantum cryptography. And companies that have that data liability will have to work on that as well. There are three big buckets of use cases, either optimization cases, machine learning, and pricing and simulation. Right? Everything that a bank or an insurance company or an asset manager does can probably be added into one of these packets. So I'm going to put, this is probably my worst slide full of text, so it goes against your, your 101 on, on slide presentation, but I'll try to talk over it. Basically, we have all these use cases running at the moment. Now we are evaluating which ones are going to be the 2024 use cases. On this, what we are trying to answer is not whether we have a quantum advantage today, we know that answer is going to be no, but when exactly that will happen. So for that, we evaluate what is the current problem with real world data, not toy models, not synthetic data, real data from the hood. If we're doing asset management, I want to see the correlations between all those assets, the ones that we have. So for example, we, we use uh, quantum reservoir computing, which is a very interesting technique that, that has been taking a lot of uh, interest in the last uh, few years for hurricane intensity, uh, intensity modeling. We want to know whether a hurricane is going to increase or decrease in, in, in intensity and what exactly is going to hit in Baja or in Seattle. We have been working with a company uh, called uh, Rigetti uh, on recession modeling. We have plenty of classical models for recession prediction, both at the country level and, and at the state level. Um, and with quantum-based signature kernels and time series analysis, we believe there may be an angle there. Not necessarily from the speed perspective, but potentially from the accuracy. We do proxy modeling for using tensor network uh, uh, techniques. Tensor networks are part of what we call quantum-inspired methods. That is, mathematical methods that are based on, on algebra that came from the physics world, but they run on classical software. So they are very promising on some of these problems. Uh, we do flood, uh, flood forecasting, and we do that for the UK government. And we do that by simulating uh, partial differential equations. If there's any mathematician in the room, probably you will know about this, but the financial industry is full of PDEs. So if we can find an optimized way to solving PDEs, then we're going to have a really great time. Uh, Metropolis Hastings, dynamic and microeconomical climate models, so basically insurance companies can calculate your premiums better, um, and strategic asset allocation. All that is very beautiful, but how do we make it real? How do I demo this to that person that was asking me for a demo uh, a couple of years ago? That is why we're launching in Q1 a, our quantum platform. We're calling this QF Studio. 
And it's a platform that allows our clients, or anybody for that matter, to add their solvers and benchmark their classical quantum-inspired and quantum solutions. You can think about this almost like a, like a CI-CD platform that delivers your models in the same way that we have done that in the machine learning industry. So we can integrate that from an API perspective into the different application. And of course, we leverage AWS as a whole and Bracket specifically for delivering this. Basically, it's a platform where you can, see all, all, you can put all your solvers in there, you can analyze them, you can run workflows and see immediately which ones are doing better or worse and in what sense. And by benchmark, I mean business benchmark. Is this faster? Is this cheaper? Or is this better? By better being defined by business. So this is fully integrated into the AWS platform. For some of you, the engineers and DevOps in the room, this is basically the hybrid concept that Richard was talking about. Our solvers are run in, in containers. So there's EKS, Kubernetes containers, or Fargate. And then when the circuit is prepared and the data is encoded, that is sent to the devices through Bracket or some of the direct devices. And then the decoding phase comes back into the, into the system. So it's really, I'm really happy to show this because Q1 is going to be when we launch this in general availability. And at the end of the day, what is going to be your main message? Why your company needs to be here? If you have the data and you have the models and the domain knowledge, quantum advantage is meant to happen. So thank you very much. I uh, hope I convinced you to start your quantum teams in your company and happy to answer any questions later on.